Well, this is the 11th session in the adult discipleship class I've been teaching on what the Bible teaches about salvation or the doctrine of salvation. And in this class, I've mentioned each time that I'm using the book by John Murray called Redemption Accomplished and Applied. In the first five sessions, we looked at the redemption accomplished part. That is what God has done to accomplish salvation through his people, for his people, through Jesus Christ. Another way you could describe that is the atonement. And then in these last 10 sessions, we've been covering redemption applied. That is how God actually applies the salvation that he accomplished through Jesus Christ to his elect in time and space. Now, to begin with, in this second part of the class where we're looking at redemption applied, we began by establishing uh, the order of the application of redemption, uh, also called the order of salvation, or in Latin, the ordo salutis. And the part of the ordo salutis that we've been looking at would begin with effectual calling, then regeneration, then faith and repentance, then justification, then adoption, then sanctification and perseverance, and finally glorification. And so after establishing that basic order of the application of redemption to the elect in time and space, we've begun looking at each part of that uh, order more closely. So far we've looked at the effectual calling, regeneration, repentance and faith, and justification. And in this class we're going to look at adoption. Now I want to just start uh, by talking about where adoption fits in the Ordo Salutis, in the order of salvation or the order of the application of redemption. So where does adoption fit? Well, if you think about how it works in the Ordo Salutis, God effectually calls his elect through the gospel by regenerating their hearts so that they will respond to the gospel in repentance and faith. And then when they respond to the gospel in repentance of faith, they immediately receive the gifts of justification and adoption from God as an act of his grace. And justification and adoption, these gifts that the elect receive from God as a gift of grace when they repent and believe in the gospel through the regeneration of God as they hear the gospel, um, these two gifts, justification and adoption, need to be distinguished from one another. They are not the same. They are distinct gifts of grace from God. Uh, justification, on the one hand, pertains to a legal standing, like we talked about in the last session, whereas adoption pertains to a relational standing. And even in the English, <clears throat> the, that distinction comes out, whereas justification has to do with sort of a legal verdict of not guilty but righteous. Uh, adoption it has to do with a relational standing in relation to um, someone else. Now, that being said, though justification and adoption are not the same, though they need to be distinguished from one another, we should also point out that in the scriptures, justification and adoption are not, are not separable. They are always granted to the believer together. In other words, the believer who is saved by grace through faith is always both justified and adopted. There's no such thing as uh, someone receiving justification uh, from God without also receiving, receiving the adoption as sons. We should also point out, we've seen justification and adoption are not the same. They need to be distinguished. 
but they are inseparable. They're always granted together. Um, also, while regeneration and adoption, or while regeneration and adoption are closely related, they too are not identical. So we've talked about justification and adoption. Now consider the relationship between regeneration and adoption. They are closely related, but they are not identical. Rather, we see in the order of salvation that regeneration precedes adoption. So, by way of analogy, you might think of it this way. Just as you are born physically into a physical family, so you are born again of the Spirit, regenerated, into the spiritual family of God, the Father. So regeneration is not the same as adoption. Regeneration precedes adoption. And then finally, one more thing under this heading of uh, adoption in the Ordo, Sol Ordo Salutis. Uh, justification as well uh, must precede adoption. And we're not talking about, again, uh, in time. Um, we're talking about course all these things sort of occur at the same time uh, we're talking rather about um, the order logical order right the logical order of these things so justification too like regeneration must precede adoption so you have regeneration then justification and then adoption in terms of a logical order in the order of salvation now what that means, or the reason for that, is that um, we have to be forgiven and reconciled to God through justification um, before we can be received into God's family. If you think about it logically, it's really impossible to reverse that order. Uh, you can't be adopted into God's family prior to being uh, forgiven of your sins, and uh, clothed with the perfect righteousness of Christ. In order to be in an adopted relationship with Christ, you first need to be in a right legal standing with respect to God in Christ. Okay, so that's a little bit about where regeneration or where adoption fits into the order of the application of redemption. Um, now, let's talk a little bit about what adoption is, the nature of adoption. And I want to use uh, Wayne Grudem's simple definition here. Um, adoption in the scriptures, with respect to salvation in other words, adoption is an act of God whereby he makes us members of his family. It's a very simple definition. I think it's helpful. Adoption is an act of God whereby he makes us members of his family. And in the scriptures, you're going to see that like justification, adoption, first of all, like Grudem says, is entirely an act of God on behalf of men. This is not a, 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 a part of the order of salvation that man has any part in accomplishing. Okay, We repent and believe but we do not participate in adopting ourselves. God adopts us as a free gift of grace. It's a sovereign act on his part and his part alone. Also, uh, like Grudem says, adoption involves bestowing a status on someone. He makes us a member of his family. Uh, so adoption is not... Uh, a matter of God actually transforming our character in any way, that's not what adoption is. Adoption is a bestowal of a status. In that way, it is like justification. We talked about this. With justification, it is not that God is making you righteous. It is that God is declaring you righteous, bestowing upon you a legal status. Well, in this sense, the same is true with adoption. In, in adoption, God is not uh, somehow ontologically making you a son or daughter of his. He is bestowing upon you a status of being his son. 
It doesn't involve an inner transformation as a prerequisite. Um, it is a bestowal of a particular status with respect to him that he grants to you as a free gift of grace. And the particular nature of this standing or status which God bestows upon a person in adoption is that he, he grants them the status of being his children, his sons and daughters, members of his family. In that sense, it is like justification. It could be called a forensic or a legal uh, act, a bestowal of a standing of being his children. Now, where do we see adoption in Scripture? I want to point you to four main texts. Um, first, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 6, where Paul says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. And so there we see that uh, adoption is one of the blessings that God has given to us in Christ. Um, and that it is entirely his act and it involves bestowing upon us a status of sonship. Next, let's look at Romans chapter 8, uh, verses 14 through 17. Here is another key passage in which you see adoption as one of the blessings of salvation that God gives to us as the elect. It says in Romans eight fourteen through 17, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. <clears throat> the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. So we see that every believer... Uh, has received the Spirit of God, and the Spirit of God is a spirit of adoption, and uh, a, the Spirit testifies to us that we are the children of God. Uh, next, Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 6. <clears throat> Paul says something very similar in this letter. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might have ado receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. So there again, we see this is an act of God's grace by which He bestows upon us a status of being his sons and then sends the spirit of sonship into our hearts uh, so that we would cry out to him as our father. One more text, John chapter 1 verse 12. <clears throat> the apostle says here in this 12th verse of the prologue of his gospel, but to all who did receive him, who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Now here we see again uh, adoption mentioned not by name, but in concept as uh, a right that God bestows upon those who receive Jesus in faith. Um, but to those, all who did receive him, who believed in his name. So all believers uh, are given the right by God to become children of God, uh, born of God. Now, that's uh, something of the nature of adoption, what adoption is. I want to talk for a second about adoption as it relates to the Trinity. Adoption as it relates to the Trinity. So, which of the three persons of 
the Godhead, uh, actually performs the act of adoption. Uh, and here we see in Scripture clearly that it is an act of the person of God the Father. Uh, a place we can see this is 1 John 3, verse 1, where, again, we don't have the explicit language of adoption, but the concept of adoption. And the Apostle John says, See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. And so we are. So the one who gives to us the status of being children of God, another way of putting that is the one who adopts us, uh, is God the Father. Um, however, we should say that like every act of God, um, the act of adoption is a triune act. Um, and so we see that uh, God the Father adopts us through the Son by the Spirit. Okay, so for instance, if we go back uh, to um, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5. We see it says, in love, he, that is God the Father in this context, predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. So God the Father uh, predestined us to adoption uh, through, as sons, through Jesus Christ. And then if you go to Romans chapter 8, verse 9 and verse 15, you see it says, You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. So if we belong to Christ, we have received the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ. And then if you look down in 15, it says, For you know, for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, uh, but... Let me fix this here. But you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. So, God adopts us through Jesus Christ by the Spirit. The Spirit who is sent into our hearts from God through Christ is a spirit of adoption, who testifies to our adoption. So, though it is God the Father who adopts, He adopts through the Son, by the Spirit. And I want to say, too, that <clears throat> when we think about our adoption, our adoption results in us being given a relationship of sonship with God the Father that is similar to that relationship of sonship which Jesus has so that Jesus can call us brothers, identify us as um, brothers, and that he can identify us as being fellow sons of the Father. We see this in John chapter 20, verse 17, where it's Jesus, having resurrected from the dead, says to Mary Magdalene, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers, his fellow his disciples, he calls them brothers, and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. That's the language that uh, reflects adoption, and there we see that Jesus identifies us as his brothers and sharing a relationship of sonship to um, God the Father. But we need to be careful in this that we do not simply equate the relationship of sonship that we have with God the Father through adoption as his uh, human people with the relationship that the Son has with God the Father within the fellowship of the Trinity. Um, in that sense, we need to recognize that Jesus as the Son within the fellowship of the Trinity has a unique sonship, a unique relationship of sonship with the Father that we do not and will never have. <clears throat> and this is why in other parts of Scripture, like in John chapter 1, verse 18, 
you see that Jesus is called uh, monogenes, that is, the only begotten of the Father. So, G- John says, no one has ever seen God, the only God, monogenes, uh, who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. So, monogenes could be literally trans- translated um, only begotten, um, but the idea in this case is unique son of the Father. It is been seen to reflect a type of eternal, a relationship between the Son and the Father that is one of eternal generation. Um, and within that is mysterious in some ways, but it all reflects the idea that Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, is the unique Son of the Father. He has a unique relationship of sonship with the Father that we could never share. And so our relationship to the Father is one of sonship. It is uh, in some way, distantly akin with that of Jesus, uh, but not the same. Finally, so that's a little bit about adoption uh, in as it relates to the Trinity. Finally, let's look at the results of adoption. Having been adopted, what does this mean for us who have been saved? And first, I want to say that adopt when we are adopted, The Holy Spirit of God, as we have seen, comes to indwell us, and he is the Spirit of the Son, Scripture says, and the Spirit of adoption, and that the Spirit of the Son, the Spirit of adoption, which is sent into our souls to live from God the Father, testifies, bears witness to our own human spirit that we are the adopted children of God and thereby enables us to relate to God as his children. And I think we see this in Romans chapter 8, um, for instance, verses 15 and 16, where Paul says, <clears throat> For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. In other words, you do not relate to God as believers. You do not relate to God as a slave in fear but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons. You relate to him as his adopted sons. And then by whom, that is by the Holy Spirit, we would cry, Abba, Father. So the Spirit enables us to relate to God as our Father, to cry out to him, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So the Holy Spirit who dwells in us testifies to our spirit assures us, reveals to us, makes certain to us that we are the children of God. And if children heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. The same thing is evident in Galatians chapter 4, verse 6, where Paul says the same thing. He says, because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you're no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. So the having bestowed upon us a standing of adoption as that we are his children. Um, He also sent into our hearts his Holy Spirit, who is a spirit of sonship, a spirit of adoption, who testifies to our spirits that we are the children of God and enables us to relate to him as such, crying out, Abba, Father. Now, our relational status As the adopted children of God, when, in other words, this gift of a standing as his children, which God grants to us by his grace, comes with uh, privileges, privileges of sonship. In other words, now that we are his adopted children, that comes with certain privileges. And so what are these privileges? Well, first... We have the privilege of being God's heirs. We, in fact, we saw this just in this last passage. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. And in the passage prior that we looked at prior to that, going back to Romans chapter 8, verses 15 through 16, remember at the end it says, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit, verse 16, that we are the children of God, verse 17. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. So 
we share <coughs> as his adopted children in the inheritance that he has bestowed upon his unique son, Jesus, uh, the Messiah. Uh, and that's why he says that we are heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. Jesus is the Son of God, and we are sons of God through our union with him. And as sons, we are co-heirs with Christ of the inheritance um, that God has given to him. Second, another privilege is that we enjoy God's fatherly favor and love. Um, in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, you remember that it says, Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. It says, In love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has bestowed upon us in the Beloved. So, God predestined us to adoption in love. And as his sons and daughters, we enjoy his fatherly love. Um, in Romans chapter 8, verse 15, another place that we see this, he says, For you did not receive a sp the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. And there again, we see that idea that our relationship to him as sons is one of fatherly favor and love and care rather than one of fear like a slave would relate to his master. <clears throat> Another place that we can see this is 1 John 3 verse 1 where it says, See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called the children of God and so we are. So another privilege of our adoption is that we now, in relation as God's adopted children, we enjoy his fatherly favor and love and care because we are his children and he is a good father. Also, um, we see that as his adopted children, we have the privilege of praying to him as our father. Uh, this is the opening line of um, the Lord's Prayer, right? Jesus teaches us to pray, our Father who is in heaven, Matthew 6, verse 9. And that is a great privilege. And we can know that he will answer our prayers like a good father answers the cries of his son. Remember how Jesus said, uh, what earthly father, <clears throat> when his son asks him for bread, gives him a snake or a stone? In the same way, if you who are evil know how to get good good give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father uh, give you the Holy Spirit? In other words, because he is a good father, far better than any earthly father, he will hear the cries of his adopted children and give them good gifts. So we have the privilege of praying to him and knowing that he will answer our prayers. Um, also, as his adopted children, we have been destined to be conformed to the image of his son in our own character. Um, so we see this in Romans chapter 8, verse 29, where it says, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. So there is a, uh, our adoption as the children of God comes with the privilege of having our own characters transformed so that we would become like his unique son, Jesus Christ, in our character. And in some ways, this goes back to the beginning, to creation, right? What God intended for human beings in general, when he made them in his image, will come to its fullest expression in uh, his redeemed people who will be transformed into the image of his son who is the true and perfect man. Now, another privilege that we have is that God the Father is committed to training us as his adopted children in love to live godly lives. And so now that he has adopted us as his children, one of the privileges is that we come under his fatherly training which is good and wise and loving. Uh, we see this idea in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 through 11. 
And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline, paideia. Uh, the, it's the idea of training. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline or train. If you are left without discipline in which you have all participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good that we may share his holiness. For the moment all discipline seems painful uh, rather than pleasant but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So there we see an extended treatment of how God the Father, now that he has adopted us as his children, trains us in love as his sons so that we might live godly lives and experience the blessed fruits that come from that as a result. And then finally, uh, as his adopted children, we have the privilege of being brought into a sibling relationship with other believers. In other words, we're brought into a family and our fellow Christians become our brothers and sisters. Uh, we see this, for instance, in a passage like 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 1, where Paul, Paul says, Do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father, younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters, in all purity. Now that's speaking of how we should relate to one another, but the language of brothers or brethren um, is is predominant throughout the New Testament as a way that believers refer to one another. In fact, it was so common in the early church that the earliest Christians were accused uh, by their pagan uh, fellow pagans, their pagans that were around them in society of incest because they, they called each other brothers and sisters and spoke of loving each other with a familial love, um, even within marriage. And so, this idea of uh, our being adopted, uh, the, the, the status that we receive as God's adopted children makes us as fellow believers, brothers and sisters, members of the same family, brings us into a sweet fellowship of love for one another as fellow children of God. Well, that's uh, a treatment of adoption within the order of the application of redemption to God's people in time and space. These things speak of realities that apply to us. And we ought to take these things to heart and rejoice in them and seek to live in accordance with them. I pray that this will be helpful to you and let me close with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for the time that we've had studying the subject of adoption. We ask that you would please be gracious to us such that you would help us to understand these things, to grow in our knowledge of the truth and that it would have a transformative effect upon our life. And we say, behold, what manner of love the Father has given to us that we should be called the children of God. And so we are. We rejoice in your adopting grace and the love that you have given to us in that new sonship relationship. And we praise you for it. And we ask that you would seal these things upon our hearts by the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.